Hello and welcome everyone. I'm your host Petri and this show helps you to build your company. We are on this journey together sharing knowledge, experience and learning from each other. In this episode I talk with serial entrepreneur and investor Lars Tweed. He has co-founded over 10 companies, wrote close to 20 books about business and marketing and his remote work setup is something you don't want to miss. Hey Lars, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing very fine. Um, I am in Croatia. I've been here now for the last, uh, what is that, seven weeks living on a boat and where I have uh, my business meetings are that people fly up to uh, be on a boat and then we discuss business. And then I trade financially and I I have just uh, almost finished a new book. Uh, So I enjoy life a lot and have just made the decision um, that for the rest of my life, I think I want to be on a boat the entire summer and work that way because it's really efficient, actually, for me. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well as well. Thank you. Um, It's been a colorful summer in in all the means. Um, Just getting back to the floating office, how how does that actually work? You know, if... uh, First of all, how can I get uh, have a meeting with you? How can I get to the boat? What, what I'm supposed to do? Do I need a charter, uh, you know, some kind of a helicopter? Or how, how does it work? The Mediterranean is a very civilized area, so there, there are great airports. <laughs> um, some of them you have lots of direct connections. And Split, for instance, in Croatia is really super well connected to everything. Palma in Mallorca also. Uh, later, I'm going to Corfu, which also has pretty good connections. So. Uh, so far, uh, I think there have been around 60 different people on the boat, on and off, and uh, they, none of them have had to do indirect flights. So it's been quite easy for everyone. That's nice. Is this your first summer doing this, or is this already like a habit? I have been sailing a lot in the summers since 2006, but um, it's first it's first time that it occurred to me that instead of I go to the boat and sail for a while and go back that I want to have the boat as my house. I, I want to think of it as my house. Uh, and um, I work a lot, but I I found out that in the way I work, this is, this is efficient because sometimes in business we have a complicated issue, not necessarily a problem, it can also be a creative challenge. And if I take the group of people working on it um, off-site <laughs> and, and, and offshore as it is for three, four, five, seven, uh, or 12, 14 days where we uh, work on the task, but we also swim, we water ski, we do other things, then we achieve something that we would never achieve if we worked in a more traditional way, you know, having meetings in an office and so on. And it, it is a little bit, uh, it reminds me of uh, something called the Hemingway Bridge. The Hemingway Bridge is, is one of the many creative processes that exist. Hemingway, he would write a chapter on a book. And then we, when he was finished with that chapter and tired and wanted his whiskey, which he drank a lot of, he would just before he opened the bottle, he would just uh, start on the next chapter because he was still in a writing mode and write you know, half a page or two pages of the next chapter, and then he would stop. That That is called the Hemingway Bridge. It's a bridge to the next task. And then um, when he started on the next chapter the next day, because he already started it, he did not get writer's block ever. So... What happens when we are working on something is that we, you know, we sit and discuss you know, how can we do this, can we do that, blah blah blah, and we we move forward somewhat, and then it stops, and then we swim, we have dinner, we sleep, and the next morning somebody just has it, just has the solution. Um, so we have kind of the day before we kind of written the first pages of the solution but we couldn't get any further we were tired but then we pick it up the next day so it's intensive creative work but uh, it does need the time and I think creativity is, is 
largely not something that goes on in a brain, but between brains. And uh, I just, I've, I've done this for many years, but it has become more and more clear for me how efficient it is. So uh, I want to really make a virtue out of this. Also, of course, it's enjoyable. So <laughs> um, that's a part of it. Is the sea always calm when you're having visitors there and you want to work? Or is there something, you know, when you're like, okay, I, I really miss my office? The, when you're on the mid, you can get uh, like a, a, within two weeks, you maybe get three or four days where you have a passing depression and and winter, but then we just go to port and then it's fine. So it doesn't really disturb anything. You started the seafaring quite early. You were like nine years old, Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> oh that yes but okay so the first the first boat i was on was a freight ship sailing to to greenland and um the, at that time i don't know if they still do that but at, at that time they were making extra money on having three or four cabins that for guests so my my family and i we were we were there and i was nine and <laughs> it was eight days uh, sailing to to uh, Christian's Hope in in Greenland, in the Disco Bay, and out of the, the eight days, four days we have hurricane, and my uh, my sister was so seasick. For some reason, I didn't get seasick, but we were really thrown around. So um, even though it was uh, quite hard trip, I liked it so lot so much, and it's it's got. Uh, I can't explain why I feel so happy on a boat, but it, I think it's got something to do with freedom. The feeling that, you know, that, that you can go anywhere and uh, you can see, you know, towards the horizon in all directions, it, it makes me feel so relaxed. And, and I sleep incredibly well on a boat. And I hear many people, they say the same. Some people don't like it. Some people are uncomfortable with being floating with maybe a kilometer of water below you but but to me it's fantastic i feel uh, i don't know if if you have ever thought that woo i'm like made for this i've um um shooting with bow and arrow <laughs> once i thought that this is strange because i feel like i'm made for this and i have the same with being on a boat could you do that year round uh, then I think it would become too much. So um, summer on a boat and in the winter I live in, in Switzerland. So that's a lot about skiing and that's a different thing. Uh, it, it, so on the summer you do the creative work with the teams and then you just execute in the winter time. Uh, not exactly <laughs> because I do the same things that, that we do on a boat. I do, uh, I have a place in Verbier, which is a ski resort. And then I, I invite people up there and we do the same things. And so this is, it is work, but it feels like pleasure. And I am more happy sailing or skiing with a team of people where we're doing a project than without that team of people doing a project because it, um, I enjoy the, the mental work, but I really enjoy it in combination with the lifestyle things we do. How many projects are you working at the same time? I was counting a couple of months ago that I had 16 different projects uh, going, you know, big and small. But uh, right now I'm, I have uh, your co-founder of the Venture Capital Fund. I have uh, Supertrends, which is a, a company that is crowdsourcing a timeline for the future. It's a very big project. And I have Supertrends Institute, which is a think tank. And then I have two books book projects, the one that I'm finalizing right now, which is about investing. Um, and then another one uh, that I'm working on with, a, on with a McKinsey partner, which is about how to organize companies for a more dynamic future. Then I have my trading activities, um, also on the hunt for a new boat. And so many different projects and each of the product project, I, I have the liberty that most of it, what I have to do, does not have any tight deadlines. So it's not, 
my life is not at all like a typical uh, corporate, big corporate uh, C-suit person who has an agenda every day, you know, from 9 to 9.30, you have to do this and so on. It's more like the Hemingway Bridge that I work on a project until I stumble or I get tired on that and then I switch to another one and then I move that forward a bit and then I switch to the third one. And sometimes, of course, when you have so many projects, you can think mm, nothing ever gets finished because I'm pushing a little bit on too many things. But but nothing, things do get finished. I do reach, I I do get the pleasure of closing a deal or a trade or a project frequently enough that I I feel really the joy of um, getting stuff done. Do you have a key people you always rely on on the projects or do you work with different people in different projects if i have some specific people that i like anchor anchor men or, yeah, yeah 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 indeed so because you have so many things going on you, you get to know some people and these are good guys and we do you know things together and, and then we find new projects so it's like you have a you know always new project new people i have something like I would say uh, five people that I I very often turn to to discuss anything, uh, but I also definitely have my wife uh, who um, who in many ways is more clever than I am, um, and then I have <laughs> I have some two really sharp children who who have one advantage over me, and that is that they uh, they see things with young eyes and can tell me that what I'm doing is old fashioned and I should do it in a different way. You've been founding more or less 10 companies at least. Uh, how, how did that all start? Was it clear from the beginning that you, you want to do your own things or what was the sort of the first, first time you realized that, hey, I, I want to build something by myself? You know, it's difficult to describe how you started things. Um, so when you ask me that question, <laughs> it's difficult for me to to pinpoint any specific point where I started becoming an entrepreneur. I can tell you this, though, that when I was a student, um, there were two people who came to me with two different ideas that became two different companies. And in each of those cases, they came to me. Um, one, it was a friend who had the idea that uh, to import cookies from Greece to Denmark, and the ideas are cookies. Yeah. So the idea just those things you eat, and not the the data cookies. The thing, the, 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 yeah, cookies. the the wafers and you know the cookies. So the it's in the idea sounded insane because Denmark is a huge exporter of cookies. And Greece is absolutely not known for making that. But that at that time, Greece uh, had their own currency and was really cheap. So we could just sell it cheap. You know, these cookies cheaper than anybody else. So we imported them by the container and sold them to supermarkets. And uh, we had something like three percent profit margin, um, but but very big volume. And so um, we made for a student decent money on that and then I had another friend who was working in computer supplies and he said that the people get irritated eyes from sitting a lot with screens and the reason is that there's a static field around a computer screen and if you break the static field um, dust will not get attracted to your eye and then he had a solution to that and we started doing that and we, it was so easy to sell so we sold it uh, with private label to a lot of companies and we made the big mistake of not considering that one bottle it was a tiny bottle was really enough for a life supply so um, it was super successful but then we, we kind of saturated the danish market within half a year and then everybody was happy everybody who wanted it had it uh, so it was a strange feeling for me, uh, and we were not set up to scale it internationally, although we had dreams of doing that. So um, the two first startups there, they were they were fine, but uh, they did not scale uh, much. However, having been having done the process of registering the company, setting up an accounting system, and just you know figuring out these the basics of all of that. Um, was uh, quite useful and motivating for what had to be done later in life. 
did you immediately set up a third company or something else happened between? Because you've also been writing many books and, and was it like uh, 27 when you started to do marketing books and, and teaching marketing as well. So you, you're parallelly doing, you know, doing a lot of things at the same time. Uh, no, I did not immediately set up a third company. I went out to, to get a job. So at that time, my my thought was that I would for a while have a normal career and learn about how business is done in big and small companies. What happened, though, was that um, I got employed in a company where the which was entrepreneurial. And then I saw the big, big difference between how you do business in established companies and how you do it in, in entrepreneurial startups. And then I really, I, I felt that I had to work as an entrepreneur after that. And, and I've done that ever since. So how long did you last in the corporate life? I was eight years uh, employed in two different places. First two years in the Danish Agricultural Marketing Board and then six years in in a part of what is now called Arla Food, where I was first doing marketing. And then later I, I, I got a job in the finance department where I became chief corporate dealer. And that, that, that experience was absolutely amazing for me because First of all, I found out that I have a talent for investing and trading, um, which has been useful. But, but well, I, I put it this way that it's been useful because I've, I've been investing well in my life. But it's also been useful because with startups and you know commercial activities, I have had a very keen eye on the risk from business cycles, and I've been quite successful in avoiding getting caught up in recessions uh, with a big exposure. So I actually wrote a book quite early in my career, uh, which in English is called Business Cycles. Uh, in Danish it's called Crisis, Crashes and Caviar, if I translate it, but it is uh, a deep dive into how business cycles work and how you can predict them and how asset markets uh, behave during uh, business downturns. Uh, that has been so useful for me. And I think I spent, the, the, um, I've, I've written 17 books now, but this is one of the two books where I spent most work. I think there's a man year work in that book about business cycles. You mentioned that this, you did it uh, pretty early in your career so has anything changed and you know is it still completely valid or do you think that you have refined the model and and, and then sort of a lead on question where are we actually now in the business cycle I don't, I don't think anything material has changed in how business cycles uh, work I think they have been uh, for as long as we can track back through history they have been pretty much the same uh, except that they have they are not as violent now as they used to be because the central banks have been have learned a lot uh, the last time that uh, modern western economies uh, and japan and so on made big structural mis mistakes in handling business cycles was in the side of the crisis in 1930s so this is 90 years ago and since then they've, they've had a pretty good take on it then they made a big they did do another big mistake in 1970s with something called the fisher curve where they thought um th th there was a trade-off between unemployment and inflation that where they were wrong so we got an inflation problem but now they really understand it very well and i have uh, I'm, I'm quite skeptical of a lot of things uh, governments and states do, but uh, I do love the central banks. I think they're fantastic. If I should give you a, a short uh, summary of what everybody <laughs> needs to know about business cycles, then it is that there are three kinds of business cycles. One is is, is um, not serious. It's, it's driven by um, inventory. And the average duration is like four and a half years. The second one is about capital uh, investments. So this is investments in software and buildings and uh, um, offices and, and so on, machinery. 
and that has a cycle duration of uh, nine to ten years. And then there's a third one, which is in real estate, and that uh, has a duration of 18 to 20 years. And statistically, those durations are solid. So they have been found in many different countries. They have been valid over many, many years. Um, but um, the statistical averages are not a forecast. So you cannot say that you know, definitely the next real estate crisis comes 18 to 20 years after the, the previous one. But you should expect that it's quite likely that it comes some, you know, around within within something like that interval and between these three different business cycles that have different duration there's a very strong phenomenon called mode locking so they lock into each other in, in uh, harmony so you have you have every 10 year you have a serious crisis every second of those serious crises is a real is a real estate crisis and that real estate crisis leads to a banking crisis which leads to a very severe depression and or, or recession and that is what we had in 2008 uh, where the cleanup lasted all the way to 2013 and and where the whole financial system was brought to the brink and um, so I, I if, if we look at that we I, I don't expect uh, international uh, real estate crisis until say 2030 around there um, but if you look at um, I said every 10 year we have a serious recession so we have now it's 2020 we have one now we had one in 2008 to 11 at least we had one in 2000 where Nasdaq crashed and so on we had one in 19 to 91 we had one around 1980 um, then we had a bonus recession in 74 to 75 because, because of the oil crisis. So that was a, not a natural recession. That was that was created by a political event. Um, but in the absence of any specific political or, or natural uh, events, you would expect every 10 years to get a crisis. And so that's quite important both in planning commercial business and in, in investing. Um, so, to the question of where are we now, I think we would, we actually, we were not supposed to get a recession in 2020 because uh, the normal leading indicators that suggest that now a recession is coming were not really sounding alarm. Um, so we got COVID instead. So COVID triggered this uh, recession. Otherwise, I think it would have come maybe uh, two years later. Um, but I think that getting out of this recession, there's a pretty good chance that we have uh, an upswing that lasts 10 years. And, and people have been wondering so much about how, how come the stock markets have been doing so well when the, the current data are, are so bad. But the stock market is, is forward looking. And so the, the stock market looks at what's going to happen with the economy the next many years. And when the interest rates are low, you are discounting future earnings with a very low discount factor. And and I can compare it to imagine that you want for Christmas, you, you, you have this Christmas calendar where every day for 20, 24 days in, in December, there's an apple for you every day. And you know that around 10% of the apples, one out of 10 apple is bad. You don't know which, but that's the. It's always been like that. One out of ten is bad. Now, as you're looking at the tray, you realize that the first apple you have to eat is a bad apple. You think, hmm, I don't want to pay the full price for this tray of twenty-four apples because the first one is bad. That's the only thing I know is the first one is bad. I also know on average ten percent of that. But so I will pay a bit, little bit less because there's a bad apple right there. Um, how much less would you pay? I would pay maybe five five percent less, ten percent less, because there's a bad apple that I can see right there. Um, but you would not pay thirty percent less or thirty six percent less. And the reason I say thirty six percent less is that the standard of poor's five hundred dropped thirty six percent because of the COVID crisis. That's completely excessive. Because we know now, we know that 2020 is a bad apple. 
but we can reasonably assure that the next nine apples are good, then probably get one or two bad apples around 2030, and then we get good apples again. That does not mean that the entire package, so the value of the stock market is 36% less worth. So on average, uh, that stock market since World War II has dropped 34% in recessions. This one drops 36%. And the mistake people make is that they have this short-term view. They look at what the news the, in the newspaper. And as a financial traders, they have a saying that says, if it's in the press, it's in the price. Um, but that's an understatement. It's if it's in the press, it's over discounted in the price. So you should when when the press is full of horrible things, um, you should buy. And when the press is full of great, great stuff, you should sell. So my my view is this that uh, there are good times ahead. We have obviously we still have a COVID overhang until there's hopefully a vaccine or efficient ways of helping people when they when they get it. But that's kind of it. Looks like we have a vaccine this year or next year, and and then that's out of the way, and then we have cheap money and are, are ready for a, a quite extended uh, upswing. So that was my answer to that question. I, <laughs> I hope it was not too long, but I've written, excuse, pardon me, I've written a book almost 400 pages about the subject. So, <laughs> Well, that's the, you know, I, I guess that's the perfect answer. Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's really short considered that there's like a 400 pages of, you know, wisdom. Um, you also wrote an, another book called Super Trends. Yes, and it came out just uh, within the you know the last was it actually earlier this year or was it already late last year? Late last year. But you know, it, yeah, but it was before Corona hit. Yeah. So has something already outdated, or would you change something there, or are you actually, or an even more fun question, did you predict, or was it sort of in the book that you know there could be things like a Corona happening? I did not predict uh, Corona happening. Bill Gates did actually, um, uh, and and interestingly, I found out. So I have Netflix. I don't know. If, do you use Netflix? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Too okay. much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a there's a documentary series on Netflix called um, Explained. I think it is called, and in that uh, there is one episode which is called Where Will the Next uh, pandemic come from and that came out the summer of 19 and it's there's a quite long scene where they show a wet market in China it um, and then they said it might well very well come from a wet market in China and then they explained that the company you know uh, the way that you had dead and, and live animals of different species, including bats and people at the same time, at the same place was perfect breeding ground for a new pandemic virus or a new virus which could create a pandemic. So uh, clearly scientists saw the risk of that. And, and when I say Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates and others have been warning for a long time that the world should, you know, we should be better prepared for this kind of uh, disaster. But I did not predict it in super trends. Um, so as now, it's the, the, the book is so recent that, uh, that I have almost no time to be wrong yet. It takes longer time to be wrong on these things. But but uh, I can just say that, that uh, what we have been going through has accelerated a, a movement that was going on already, a movement towards uh, remote working, e-commerce, etc. And, and we can see that, for instance, in, in the massive increase in the sales from Amazon. And, and, um, so these things would have happened anyway, but perhaps they were moved five years forward by, by, um, by this lockdown event. And a lot of people, they did their first email e-commerce transactions ever. Um, a lot of people realized for the first time how efficient perhaps it was for them to work from home. I've seen statistics on on how many how big a 
uh, percentages of the population in different countries can work from home. And in the more developed countries, like the, the more wealthy uh, Western European nations plus the US, it's about 50%. Half the population can work from home. And of course, there was before this, there were people working from home. There were people who had an, a fixed agreement that they would work from home one day a week, for instance, or they would do it occasionally. But it was also perhaps frowned a bit about, about because are you really working when you're at home or, or what are you doing? Um, now they were forced to work at home and then everybody you know, you could not. Nobody could frown at each other. You, we were all working at home, and it, and in some cases, people they discovered that it was actually more efficient. And I, I've, <clears throat> I've been doing this for twenty years, so so um, I'm very used to it. And it had, does have dis disadvantages, but it certainly also has advantages. For me to put in, as I do sometimes, I put in fourteen hours a day. It's not that hard if I work at home because I, I get up, I start working straight away. Um, I, I take a break, I do sport. I uh, After lunch, I take a nap. I take a power nap of 20 minutes. Um, if I'm mentally tired or something, I take a little walk. You know, it's quite efficient if you need to put in a lot of, of hours on a project. So... I think people realize that the other thing, you know, some people have a lot of traveling time, uh, which is very exhausting and unproductive, and um, they got rid of that. So, yeah, it, it moves some things forward to the benefit of everybody. Just pausing a bit for the, you explained how you work and, and you know, the way you work. Is that something you learned over the years? And do you have some kind of advice for the entrepreneurs who are maybe having their first startup and there's always too much to do, uh, there's never enough hours and it's Hello? marathon and not a sprint? Of course, that's a very broad question because uh, there are so many answers that uh, I co-authored a whole book about <laughs> all the things you need to do. But well, what's the title of the book? Is it in, in Danish or English? It's it's uh, it's out in English. It's called Entrepreneur: uh, Building Your Company from Start to Success. Um, That's a rather recent book, isn't it? It's like two or three years old. Uh, yeah, two years old, I think. Um, the the first thing I think if you um, if you want to start a company is that you 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 should find out. What is your purpose with starting a company? Is it because you have a great idea that you know you just happened that you made an invention or or saw this great opportunity, or is it because you have a great desire to start a company and you are looking for the great idea? Second is um, is it a growth company or a lifestyle company? And I think in to make the decision between those two, you have to figure out what kind of person you have you are, what personality you have. So uh, just let me just define. So a lifestyle company could be a law firm. It could be a restaurant, um, dentist, or something where uh, it's your job, but you you run the show yourself. A growth company is typically, for instance, a software company, some, th something that can scale a lot and where you, you might attract uh, external investors who come in because they think they can get their money 10, 30, 50 times back if you succeed. So one difference is um, if you're an idea person, you you probably want to, to become serial uh, entrepreneur because you, you get all these ideas for things that can start. You want to start them up and then once they're up and running, you want to find somebody else to run them and then start the next thing. Uh, Richard Branson uh, has started apparently around 500 companies. I'm not sure he came up with all the ideas. So, 500? Yeah. And wow. I think he closed down 300. Of them. Yeah, we closed down more than half, I think. But he, you know, all the times he, he gets ideas. For instance, I, I once read that he started a, a, a ski company called Virgin Snow, mainly because he just thought the name was so cool that he had to start that company. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, so he bought a domain name and then was like, uh, oh, doesn't matter. 
but uh, other people are people people and the people people they um they love to build a, a team around them and they they bond with that team they feel that this is their family and they don't like the idea of of ever selling that because it's like selling your family and so these people will typically build one company and, uh, and make it if they're successful they'll make that company into a giant company and then they'll, maybe they'll sell it on the 60 or 50 or they'll sell some of it to get some money out but keep the controllers as long as they possibly can perhaps until that last day on earth so i i always for everything i recommend young people to um, to take personality tests and there are, there are lots of them on the net so it's it's something anybody can do and then reflect on what kind of person am i what kind of role should i pay, play in a startup am i a startup person at all um, am i a people person am i a dear person am i a, a person who like to work with practical things instead then the second thing is that statistics show that you have much higher chance of success if you are more than one founder many of the most successful companies they start with three or four two or three founders and then eventually only one runs the show and the other ones drop out um, there's one one great big except two two big exceptions is Elon Musk and and uh, well uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Jeff Bezos, he was a single founder that that went pretty well. But but on average, it's better to be several founders. And then you have to have this discussion between the the founders about what what do they expect from this? Do you, do you, they see it as a lifestyle project or as a growth project? Do they expect to work eighty hours a week or twenty hours a week? Um, do, are they complementary? Do they have shared values? I think you have to have different competences, different network, but shared values. If you don't have shared values, then that that will become an issue at, at some point. Um, so, if ideally you have somebody who has great technical skills, somebody who has great sales and marketing skills and somebody who has great operational skills. So by operational skills, I mean somebody who makes sure that everything is executed upon, you know. So um, I think these are the most important early considerations when you want to do a startup. You are VC, venture capitalist. Um, how do you evaluate opportunities and, and what are the most important things when you're considering a new company? Should you invest? Yeah, so in our in our book, we actually have an appendix where we have a list of the screening criteria, and these are based uh, to a small degree on personal experience from investing in startups and building startups, but mainly on scientific research. So there's been done a lot of scientific research on on what works and what doesn't work statistically in startups. For instance, this about having several founders is one of the one of, many, one of the many criteria, but I look very much for um, um, some kind of boundaries against competition, and the the most common boundary in growth companies in these days is a network effect, and I think that. Very often when I look at a business case, I look at does it have a, a network effect, but also could it have a network effect or could it have more more elements of network effects than it, it is currently enjoying? Because if, if you have a network effect, you, you, you have the ability to make substantial profits. And um, if you don't, then even if the market grows a lot, if you don't have any barriers against competition, you might also grow a lot, but you're never going to earn a lot. And and so this is very important to me. And, and there I said it. So I said, if the market grows a lot, of course, you want you really prefer that it's a growth market and that is very big and that it, it, uh, it can scale globally. Um, I look a lot on the team that the dream team is somebody who has worked um, before in another startup, it doesn't matter much whether that startup uh, failed or succeeded. 
but in, I've tried many times. I've seen it. I've tried it. I hired, hired people that come as a team. So what happens is you have a group of people that work together. Maybe the, you have a startup with 50 people. Uh, and so there's a bit of background noise because we have a thunderstorm coming towards the boat. So we're just tightening up a couple of things. So um, let's say you have a high pressure startup uh, with 50 people and let's say it goes down. You know, the most common exit for startups is bankruptcy. Let's say it goes down. And then after it goes down, five of the people, they really liked to work together. I can be pretty sure that that's a good team because they have been working together in a very high pressure situation and they want to do it again. So such a team might start a company, but they might also join a startup company as a team. And that, 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 is, that is an ideal situation. And, and the opposite um, is something that very often goes wrong and that I've tried also to, to get hurt on that, burn my fingers, is that you hire somebody who comes from the, the established corporate life with a great CV and you get super flattered that this person who has a great CV from a well-established brand company wants to work in your company. So that's like an endorsement. It is telling you that that this person thinks that your company will be become such a well-established big brand company. But these people are, are used to working in a completely different environment. It's an environment where the work is laid out. There's a description of your job. Uh, in many cases, if they are senior, they have a fixed agenda. The, you, they have somebody who just tells them, now you have to go to this meeting, that meeting, and now there's a, um, a budget, blah, blah. You know, everything is, is planned for them. You come into a startup, nothing is planned for you. You have to, to make make up as you go. It's like driving a train, but you have to put down your ways while you're driving the train. And I... I so I've experienced, what, four times uh, the frustration of this going wrong, <laughs> uh, um, starting with that they start writing a lot of reports. But to whom? Nobody, nobody reads long reports in a startup. Um, and, and they, when the coffee machine or the printer doesn't work, uh, they can't figure out why nobody comes and fixes it for them and start. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh because I, I, I sense you. You have tried this yourself, and so, so, so instead of that, uh, there is in the startup environment a lot of gunslingers, guns for hire, that do nothing their entire career than going from startup to startup. Uh, they work for quite low salaries, but they get stock options, and some of the startups they work in, it works out, and then they, they. Uh, get their savings and their wealth from that. Uh, but they can only work in a startup environment because that is how they are. Uh, some of these people have the same saying that I have, which is that uh, when a company hires the human resources manager, I leave <laughs> because then the magic is gone. <laughs> and, uh, the magic is when everything is like a family, it's informal. Um, and everybody take full ownership and everybody uh, improvise. Um, somebody said, let's go and build up distribution in America. Okay, I go to America and I build up distribution. I have no idea how to do it, but I know how to, to buy the flight ticket. I also know how to book, check into a hotel. I know how to uh, find somebody who can hire people. And so um, I take, you know, people who are, who not only can work without a, a fixed plan, but who enjoy it. And uh, I actually, I, I realized myself that I prefer that kind of environment. When I was 17 years old and my parents were divorced, my father lived in Chile and South America. And he wrote to me whether that was the time where we, we, it was too expensive with phone calls. So he wrote to me whether I would like to come and live with him in Chile for a year. I wrote back to him if I could bring three friends. And and uh, <laughs> I, I, I just found that. So he said yes to that. So we came four. And, uh, 
and we had a so I had saved up by working different factories, and the other ones had also uh, old cleaning toilets in an old people's home and so on. But but we came over, and then we used his house as a base, and then we traveled around with on buses uh, in six countries, and with a budget of three dollars a day per person. There was no mobile phone, we had no credit card, so there was no no possibility of getting help for all the situations we came in and I got knocked, knocked down at the carnival in Rio and my, both my eardrums blew uh, in a train and you know, lots of stuff went wrong for us all the time. Uh, we realized that we had to be 18 years to cross any border and our two of us were 17. So in one border we sneaked into the border control and, and took their stamp and stamped our own passport and sneaked out. <laughs> we did everything we could. And and I realized that the fact that there was no help was a thrill to me. I loved it. I loved that we had to sort out everything ourselves. And so that, that kind of thing makes me happy and makes me very productive, but it makes other people unhappy or, and unproductive. So this is something you can find out a lot about by taking a personality test, but you can find out even more by trying it. And uh, which brings me to, I think, uh, another interesting consideration that is, if you want to be an entrepreneur, instead of starting your own company, you can get a job in somebody else's startup company first. And if, if, uh, if you are a skilled person, maybe you get offered stock options and then you, you might even earn the money that enable you to to start your own company afterwards, but you certainly you find out if you like this and if you're good at that. Maybe you don't like it, then then no harm done. You've been there half a year, two years, whatever. You find out that wasn't for you, fine, and then you can move on with your life. Of course, the ideal situation is that you you start the company um, while you're a student, and that that is something my daughter did. For instance, she started a company three months after she joined university. So if that had gone on bad, there would be no loss, no risk, not, no downside at all for her. But it went well, so um, that that's perfect. But you know, you have to have an idea in order to to start a company. But she she ran into an idea. How do you come up with all the ideas? How do you come up with the projects? What what keeps you motivated of exploring new things? Uh, you probably have uh, enough money that you don't need to work, you know, just for the sake of working. But you, you, you know, clearly love what you're doing. About money, I, if you like yachting, I think that there's, you can never get enough money. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a little bit more than you have. Yeah, it's always a little bit more, and then you buy a bigger boat, and then you're not enough anymore. But, but. <laughs> um, so the way you can navigate in life is. Um, with a laser or with a radar. So with a laser, you, I mean, the, the ext- extreme version of working with a laser might be, you know, you're inheriting your your family's uh, farm and you have to farm that farm. And that's, that's what you have to do. And then you marry the neighbor's daughter or son. Um, or you can have a career plan. And if you work with a radar, um, you don't think that far ahead at all. You just do something you find interesting and then you stumble into something else and stumble into something else. And interestingly, there's there's been, you probably know, there's been a lot of research into what makes people happy. There's been a little bit research, scientific research, into what makes people lucky. And there's actually, there's a scientist called Weissman. Uh, he uh, put adverts in, in media where he asked people who thought that, that they were generally very unlucky people or generally very lucky people. So he asked them to participate in experiments. And one, one of the things he did was he, gave the, he, he created a newspaper. In that newspaper, you had to count how many pictures there were, and uh, then you would get some money if you counted it right. So the, the people who were unlucky, they would they would go through the entire newspaper and count all the pictures and get their reward. The lucky people, they would notice that on page five, I think it was, there was a story that said, you can stop counting now, there are 22 pictures. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and so he made a lot of different experiments that showed that a lot of people they they are not only looking at the task just ahead they're looking at anything he also see, he set up a meeting in a bar and then with you know the subjects and then he deliberately came 20 minutes late for the meeting but he set up the candid cameras and filmed what they did while they waited and the lucky people where they would start talking with with other people around them the unlucky people would just stare into the wall and be frustrated that he was late for the meeting so in order to get ideas you have to look you you should not only look at the task the well-defined task ahead of you you should have a general curiosity and so you can execute on having a general curiosity by of, of course you know going lots of places being in lots of countries reading a lot talking with a lot of people um and it it will create for you a picture of the world like it's like a a big patchwork of the world and then in that you will just see things that can be combined because innovation is only combination steve jobs he said that quite famously that you know sometimes people come up with a great innovation they're 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 a bit embarrassed by how simple it was because they just saw a combination they did not make anything they combined some things that already existed and since then I sometimes i've been thinking about can i think of any any innovation which is not a recombination of something that that does not that exist already so i think the more you see the more likely it is that you you see new combinations um and the funny thing is that your life is more more fun if you let live that way so that that is that is how it happens then after you get the idea then as people also say it's one percent inspiration 99 percent perspiration so after they get the idea you have to work a lot on executing on it and refining it and then we come into the whole uh, new discipline of how to run a startup company where you use you don't use traditional business planning uh, and business plans but you um, you, you have a much more fluid planning system. You make uh, minimal viable products and, and so on. Um, and one thing I've learned um, partly the hard way as, as an entrepreneur is that I like to start slowly if I can. You know, if there's no immediate competitive pressure, I like to start slowly with a startup, burning very little money while you work well with the idea and continue to work with the idea while you are trying to figure out how to get it right and this is called nail it before you scale it so i prefer to nail it you know take my time nailing it and then once i see that I, I, once i believe that now it's really good then you scale it and then you scale it very aggressively you that you don't always have the privilege to give yourself that time but if you can that's what i prefer to do think about it for a long time and and when you think about it that also means talk with other people about it can i ask you a question how do you learn best do you learn best by doing by listening by writing uh, by reading by talking what what is your most efficient way of learning I'm pretty much like uh, eyes open. I'm I'm reading a lot. I'm listening. I'm observing. I'm questioning. I'm you know having a lot of time to do these things because I think that's what you said as well. Uh, it's you know sometimes it's not evident. What's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like what's between the spaces. You know what's between the words. And and you know to see that uh, it's not evident. It, it's how you have to get some kind of contrast. Sometimes it's time. You take a bit of time. One way, uh, I was explaining this the other day to someone that usually when you have a team, you're coaching each other so you can get quickly results. Mm, yeah, yeah. But if you don't have anyone, uh, you can coach yourself uh, with time. So if you do something and then you just let it to the table for a while and you know, let the dust settle and you come back to it like a week or two weeks or maybe a holiday, you know, if you have a one, one month holiday, whatnot. And, and then you come and you look at it with the fresh eyes or fresh ears, depending what you do. And then you can see that, oh, I've been actually evolving. This is not exactly what I want anymore. It doesn't look good, or it has this and this faults. And, and, and that's one way to, to look at it. And I think that's quite important. Um, I was also 
while I was listening, you mentioned that you've been doing a lot of investing. Uh, investment, it's so much to do with timing and with the same thing with, uh, with ideas. You can have the perfect idea, but it's just too far ahead of the market. So it doesn't work or, you know, there's something else wrong with the business cycle is wrong or mm. something happens with the timing and it doesn't work. Um, have you been studying this part? You know, is there something you can do with that? Because you can have the perfect team, you can have the perfect idea, but it's just the unfortunate timing. And by the way, I like very much your impression that you can be your own coach with time. I've never heard it said that way, but but I think that's that's um, correct. Um, I I have an inventory of ideas, and when I have an idea, I, I talk with people. Uh, I explain it to people, and I I see what comes back, and and if <laughs> some nobody seems to find it interesting nobody adds to it nobody says oh should we do this together or can i you know should we can i make a company with you where we do this or would, would you hire me for this because that sounds really cool maybe on the wrong room you know you know the the saying that you know if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, that can also be, but I try to I try to do this with people that I I, I think are clever. But uh, at least in in that respect. But when I co-founded Super Trends, the company last year, but I got the idea ten years ago when I wrote I wrote a similar book called Super Trends ten years ago, but with a different you know, as you know, angle. And when I wrote that book, I, th- I thought, hmm, I, I actually make, I could make a, a company that crowdsourced a timeline for the future. And that time I, I did exactly what I said. Now I, I spoke with different people about it and nobody seemed to be interested. And I thought, well, I'll do, I'll, I have lots of other things to do in my life. So I didn't do anything about it. I did buy the domain though, supertrends.com from a squatter. And then, um, I was working with venture capital and I thought, hmm, that's very good. There's a very good synergy between the super trends project and doing venture capital. So maybe now is a good time to start it. And then I had some students who were applying to, uh, to work in our venture fund for on projects and there were no projects. And then I just said, okay, then you can work with me in defining the super trend thing. And I took, took them sailing and I took them skiing and they had a great time. And, or it was five teams and or a number of sessions, we figured out how to do this. And then I uh, I needed uh, somebody, a company to do the coding for the software. And then I had a friend who had a software company with 800 people, very good company. So I sent him a short description of what we have in mind. And I said, you know, would you be a candidate for for implementing this? And then I met him and then he said, I've, I've looked at this and the idea you have, I had myself 10 years ago and I have conferences all over the world about tech. And normally we put up a whiteboard and then some magnets and then we draw a timeline and then we ask people a question. And when they go for lunch, they have you know, the question is about when something will happen. They have to put the magnets on the timeline uh, each you know, individually to indicate when, when they think this will happen, when can quantum computing crack, uh, you know, standard banking encryption, for instance. Um, so we have been doing this and we've also been doing it on overhead projectors and he had, he had photos to prove it. And then he said, so I can do your software on the condition that I can be your 50-50 partner in this. So this is the kind of thing I'm looking for, somebody who who, who really likes the idea I have. So lots of idea. I have lots of ideas that I think are potentially very good, but I can't find anybody who agrees with me, who is who are willing to put, uh, you know, to to take some risk on it in terms of time and or money. I think there's a wisdom there, the third one as well, that uh, it's good to talk about ideas. Nobody is stealing your idea because, you know, it, there's so many things that you need to actually, like you explained in your example, the person already figured that out. He was also looking for, you know, the, the sort of the solution or knew what, what's happening and, and, you know, what you were talking about. So I think that's one of the things as well. You already may be in the future. You see the future. You are in the future. You're living mm. the future. But you are the only one there. And it's so hard to convince other people. If other people are using horses mm-hmm. and you like uh, having a Tesla already, you know, it doesn't really work. 
and 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 that's why it's kind of safe yeah. to talk about the of course it's not, it's, it's not entirely safe but it's pretty safe and i, I read one book where um the author says i would challenge you if you have a great idea then you're afraid of some big company stealing it i would challenge you to make them like your idea <laughs> And it's almost impossible, even if your idea is great. You know, if you reverse the mindset, <laughs> but it becomes easy. You know, if you if if you think that you will only get, you have a fantastic idea. This only fantastic idea you will ever get in your life. Then I, I can understand you're afraid of somebody stealing it. I can understand that. That that that, that can be a point in that. But if you have a whole inventory of ideas all the time then you are less concerned if somebody at some point steals one of your ideas because the, the more important thing is to, to get your idea refined. And that, that, that brings me back to my question to you about how you learn. So so I'm, I'm a reader mainly. I, le I learn a lot from reading um, and I learn even more from writing. Uh, but I've, I also found that if I have to do a speech about something or a presentation of something, that when I'm talking about my thing, and I've prepared it from home, I've made PowerPoint slides or whatever, so I know what I want to say. And, and then when I'm standing there and saying it, I get an idea that changes my idea while I'm just explaining. It becomes actually quite awkward because in, you're in the middle of explaining something and halfway through you change your mind to a better version. <laughs> so shall you shall you change your mind in front of these people or shall you ignore your new idea and just go on? <laughs> I can imagine. What, what is Lars doing? Why he's asking piece of paper in the middle of the speech? Well, well I have this idea, you know, I have to just you know, write it down now. <laughs> can you wait for a sec? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I once read a description of Boris Johnson, whether people like him or not. He's very, very intelligent. But he, when he was, at, was it at Oxford? He was, I think, when they had this discussion club, and then and you had to you had to take the podium and defend a view point of view, and then he takes the podium, and then in his speech, he he uh, he has an argument with himself in his entire speech. So he. He disagrees with himself all the time and flips forth and back, and it's hilariously funny. But um, that's another matter. You have also a technique. You, you, once you had a bit of a wrong shoes, if something funny happens while you're bombing, you know, a lot of eyeballs are watching you, you know, what should you do? Okay, so the thing with the shoes is I'm, I'm famously distracted so much so that my, uh, my wife uh, asked. So I got, I, I was married for 30 years, I got divorced three years ago and then I got married last year and my, my new wife um, at one point she asked I can't understand how you're paying for your life I said well why uh, can't you understand that because you're completely disorganized everything is a, a big mess for you so how, how can you get anything to work but I have people helping me uh, getting organized. But once I, an example of how disorganized is, I am is that once I, I got up at 4.30 in the morning to take the, get to the early morning plane from Zurich to a city airport. And uh, in order not to wake anybody up, I took my, my shoes on in the dark. And only in the airport did I realize that one shoe was a church and another one was a Moresco and they look quite different. And I thought, how do I get through all these uh, high-powered business meetings in London with two different shoes on? Uh, and there was no—I had no chance of buying shoes in the airport because uh, it was, you know, I, it was a seven o'clock flight. No shops were open. So when I came into the reception, uh, I would put my briefcase just in front of my shoes, so that was fine. And then somebody came to pick me up, and then I would walk very close to them and have a very intense conversation and look them straight into their eyes. So kind of <laughs> <laughs> Almost intimidating <laughs> guy, you know. <laughs> now I wonder the people, you, you know, these people who stand too close for, to you, maybe they have some problem with their shoes. Don't do it right now. Anyway, so, and then I, I would come into a meeting room and I would like rush, rush to my chair and sit down and while staring into their eyes and, and talking, engaging them in talk while I was kind of getting, hiding my shoes. And as far as I know, I got through something like seven business meetings and the entire trip with not a single person 
noticing that I had two very different shoes on. Also, even worse, once we were selling satellite communication systems, and then I had the night before I had to go to a sales meeting, I had put all the um, um, the descriptions, which are diagrams, technical descriptions in my briefcase. <laughs> and then um, I go to the meeting, I open my briefcase while I'm talking. So I put my briefcase on the table, I open it while I'm talking. And then it's my daughter's toys inside. So <laughs> 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 so, so, a different spec. <laughs> so I kept talking while I closed the briefcase because I, I think I said something. I'll show you the diagrams, and then I just put the briefcase down and said, "Shut up!" And I said, "Instead of showing you the diagrams, I think it's easier if I draw it on you with a pencil. Do you have a pencil and a paper?" And then I was drawing for them. So she had, yeah, she had just emptied my briefcase and made it into a doll's house. So it was full of dolls. So these, these kind of things happen to me quite a lot. What is your favorite word? My favorite word is freedom. What is your least favorite word? Tyranny. What turns you on creatively, spiritually or emotionally? Music. What turns you off? That would be tyranny. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck, I think I have been working in the in the financial business uh, dealers. They say fuck a lot. So, um, yeah, so uh, it's kind of brought up with that. What sound or noise do you love? I love the sound of water, running water, or no, even more to be at the bow of a boat which is gliding through water and you can barely hear the sound of this water around the bow. That's fantastic. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, somebody putting their nails to a, <laughs> to a blackboard. <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> or a dentist drill if I, can, if I can choose to. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would like I, w I would like to be a drummer. What profession would you not like to do? Uh, auditing. If you could be a co-founder of any startup in any era, which one would you choose? I think Amazon. Um, but I am also very fascinated by uh, the Wright brothers, um, the airplane. Any final words for the audience? Yeah, that could be about the Wright brothers because they assembled their plane in nine days and then it flew. But the true story is in Matt Ridley's new book about innovation, which I, I just read. And he writes that they worked a lot on it. They, they found a French expert in aerodynamics and they wrote almost 200 letters to him asking him questions. They built dragons that had the shapes of small airplanes and tested them in, in different winds. They tested flying wings. They tested uh, sitting on flying wings. And and so my final word is that don't forget that innovation is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Thank you, Lars. This was so much fun. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find full episode notes and transcripts at www.talkswithpetri.com. If you like the show, please subscribe, tell your friends, and consider leaving a review in Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute to comment and really helps to grow the audience. Send me feedback, who would you like to have in the show, and how can I improve the experience for you. Till next time.